I think I need to tell you a little bit about the history of this actual entire Eine Kleine Nacht music. It was written when Mozart was a young man still living in Salzburg. And this particular piece and many other pieces were, were written for commissions. And so this piece was asked of him to write. And it was probably written for a special occasion, a party or something, uh, some wealthy patron. And so, believe it or not, this piece was actually background music. The entire thing was written essentially as background music for this party, of which most of these wealthy patrons probably even ignored as they were talking about their shoes and whatever <laughs> else, their wigs, and all the other things. And so, so you have this magnificent music which essentially has permeated through all of Western culture and it was written as background music. I find that truly staggering myself. And I also find it amazing that this particular piece of music, which was written for this, has survived because a lot of music that was written for special occasions or for whatever reason sometimes didn't survive. And a perfect example of that is the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. A lot of his music did not survive because it was written for a certain occasion and once it was done, it was thrown out. Or it was possibly used for something else for other occasions if necessary, but music, believe it or not, some of it was actually disposable. So um, I'm personally thankful that this survived. And another interesting thing about this particular piece, or this music in general, is that it did not survive in its original state. There is a second minuet, which actually happens after the first movement, which did not survive. And I'm not quite sure why, but I do have a theory. And my theory is that this particular piece of music is symphonic in its stature. And the symphonies of the time of Haydn and Mozart and so on were mostly in four movements. And so I believe that the second movement was actually taken away and to actually create this to be more of a symphonic work. And that's essentially one reason why it survived. Because now you have four movements and it actually is a palatable and presentable symphony if you will. And so um, that, for me, is the reason why I think it's, it's survived through the years. Now, when we're talking about conducting, one thing I haven't really discussed yet is the whole idea of time and tempo and keeping time. Of course, the baton, clearly, is something that we need to accentuate the time. So it's, it's much easier for you to follow this one, two, one, two, one, two, when you have the extension of the arm, one, two, sorry, one, two, one, two. It's certainly followable, however, this, personally, and I'm sure to the orchestra, all nod your heads, <laughs> <laughs> this is much easier to follow than this, okay? So, keeping time is a clear and important aspect of, of what a conductor does. Essentially what I'm doing there is trying to keep time. And in this case, because there's not a lot of cues that I have to do, I have to make sure that we're all together. And at this point, I'm also using both my hands to make sure that we are together, that I keep a consistent beat between the high strings and the low strings. The baton really helps in that case. Now, I need to tell you a little bit about the development of the baton and how it came into conducting. Believe it or not, the predecessor of the baton is a staff. And I'm sure you know what a staff is. Long piece of wood, usually, I guess. And in the 17th and 18th century, specifically in 17th century orchestras, which they did not exist in this 
fashion, by the way, in, in this 1600s, orchestras weren't really orchestras. They were ensembles of a variety of different instruments. But the person who was in charge of the orchestra or the group had a staff, and he would beat this staff, and he would beat it on the floor. And that was his sole function. And it wasn't until probably, I'm going to say at least 100 years, um, probably even later than that, but certainly by the time Mozart came around, there were conductors, although they m most of the time led from the harpsichord or from the piano. Um, and so that's a little bit unusual for our circumstances, but through the evolution of con conducting, we did finally get the baton in the early 1800s. And Felix Mendelssohn was one of the first real well-known conductors that actually tried to turn it into an art form. And then, of course, Hector Berlioz and Wagner. And, of course, Wagner wrote all this incredible music and decided that he would conduct it. There were other conductors that came later that uh, also developed the baton. And I do need to go back, though, to the, um, to the Baroque period because, as far as I understand, I think the only fatality from conducting happened to a, uh, at the time, very well-known uh, composer whose name was Jean-Baptiste Lully, who actually was in the process of conducting and beating his staff, as you were, and he accidentally hit his foot and injured his foot to the point where it actually, the wound festered and didn't heal and he actually died of gangrene. So that's the only conducting fatality that I'm aware of. So. <laughs> So it's a, it's a relatively safe profession. However, it is pretty easy for you to put your eye out if you go backwards. <laughs> Fortunately, I have glasses to protect that. Um, I, can also, I can also tell you that uh, the very famous conductor of the Chicago Symphony, Georg Scholte, also uh, in the midst of a passionate conducting phrase, impaled his hand <laughs> with... <laughs> with the baton. So I think those, those are the two casualties that I'm aware of. So um, I, c I can tell you, though, however, that I, ha I do have a little tidbit, of a little, little story to tell you of conducting Bow Valley Chorus, which many of these orchestra members were a part of. I actually lost my baton in the middle of a conducting, but I was able to catch it in my <laughs> left hand. So that's my conducting story for you.